Morning, everyone. I'm Soph. These are my notes. And let's go to Italy right now, specifically Northern Italy. Hey, how about Bologna? Now, I have some stressful memories associated with Bologna related to missing a megabus, my fault, and a train conductor getting angry, partly my fault. So I thought I would rewrite those memories uh, and let's do that together by discussing and enjoying what Bologna as a place does incredibly well, and that is food. The residents of Bologna, like most of Northern Italy in general, love their nosh. It's land of bolognese sauce, a variety of lasagnas, pastas, pizzas, gelatos, all with delicious wines and fresh juices to wash them all down. This is a simplification. There are loads of other foods that we don't stereotypically associate with Italy that are just as loved. But that is the point. Food is loved here. And a lot of this food, when cooked to the local standard, is rich in fats and carbs, it's swimming in broths, it's cooked in butters and oils. Essentially, these foods are packed full of stuff that we're often told to keep away from for diet reasons, depending on the diet discussions you're following. So, if we are to believe that rich, carby, fatty food is the devil incarnate weight-wise, Bolognesians should be some of the biggest people in the world but actually they are unusually slim. In this video, I'm gonna unpack one theory as to why this might be the case and discuss what we could potentially learn from Italy. Before I go on though, credit where credit is due. I was inspired to cover this topic because of a book called The End of Craving by a guy called Mark Schatzker. Now Mark's book covers a lot more than I can in this video, so I do recommend giving it a read. And I also interviewed him for a radio series that I have done for the BBC, which I will put a link to somewhere exciting stuff. Yeah, I do recommend checking out his book. Right, so let's get our Signora Marple on <laughs> and um, look for some evidence. That's the first step of any investigation, right? And specifically, the first thing to talk about to peer our nosy noses into is the relationship between Italians and their food. It's safe to say in Italy, food is taken pretty seriously to the point where the rest of us might take the piss or find it cute. There's like a protectiveness over recipes, right? Think about like family recipes, non as words that get passed down over generations. A few years ago, my partner's Italian colleague shared a tiramisu recipe with her and she was sworn to secrecy. And I have to say it is an incredible tiramisu. Broader than this, Italians are protective over food quality in general. They use this label DOP, which stands for Denominazioni d'Origini Protetta, uh, and I hope that was okay. So this is a label that goes on foods that only meet a particular quality, whether it's they're produced in certain regions, or they contain ingredients produced in certain regions, or they're made using a specific recipe. And this is to avoid imposters claiming their food is Italian when it is not. And it's worth doing a little side note here that I'm talking mainly about Italy in this video, but there are other places. France and Japan are just two other examples of places where food quality is really emphasized and given a lot of value. But one thing that this all means is that food in Italy is very real. It has the same ingredients that have been used for years, things that for years you've been able to grow and make. Whereas in other places like the US, food has developed in a slightly different way. A lot of the natural qualities of food are sometimes seen as an enemy. Yes, things like fats and sugars, especially as diet culture has taken hold, but also things like shorter shelf lives, things not lasting very long. And so with the guise of improving health, food scientists have gone about trying to make foods that taste the same, as their like normal counterparts, but are better for us. Surely that would be a win-win, right? The desire for this win-win has led to the development of something many have believed magical, additives. Additives alter the qualities of foods whilst often pretending to be something else. So sweeteners make things sweet that don't actually contain sugars. Or you can get fat replacers, like this stuff called alginate that's made of seaweed that makes ice cream creamier without the need for fats. So again, Win-win, right? Because it's healthier, you avoid sugars and fats, but also if these chemicals can be made cheaply, then you're onto a financial winner too. And potentially they lead to extended shelf lives, also financially great. So that's win-win-win. Win. But additives are based on fooling your brain, making you believe that food has stuff in it that it actually doesn't. Now this might be okay if your brain wasn't smart, but give yourself some credit. Be kind, hashtag be kind to yourself. It is smart your brain. And as I said once in a one minute video where I dressed up as a tiger, your brain is constantly predicting stuff. It's like a workaholic mystic Meg. So for example, when you taste sweetness, your brain associates that with sugar and is therefore expecting you to receive some sugar. 
and the calories you get from it. Essentially, your brain's saying, when I taste something sweet, I expect X amount of energy. But if it tastes sweetness and doesn't get sugar, that starts causing some problems because your brain's prediction was off. That makes your brain a bit weirded out. It makes things uncertain. And it's thought that uncertainty in the brain drives addiction. Uncertainty drives addiction in lots of different places, right? Think about a slot machine. You don't know when you pull the handle if you're gonna win big or not. So you keep going until you get what you're after and then often continue on afterwards. Social media's addiction is partly based on uncertainty as well. You know, is this the time that I'm gonna look at my phone and see a notification that makes my heart sing? No? Well, maybe next time, let me check in two seconds. It's that uncertainty of, are you gonna see something great or not? Are you gonna win something or not? Maybe this is even why people get hooked on people playing hard to get, you know? It's the uncertainty of, will they, won't they? Will we, won't we? And the idea is that potentially, it's not so much the desire to gain something that matters, more the fear of losing something, the FOMO. If I don't play the lottery this time, what if that would have been the one time I would have won kind of thing. And so in this context, in an additive filled world, we've made our food uncertain. Our brains don't know if they're gonna get what they expect when they eat the food. And therefore one theory is that this uncertainty makes us crave more food, just the same way that you crave checking your messages. And also simply put, if your food isn't actually giving you real nutrition, then you're gonna eat more to get the nutrition that you're missing. The way that additives missell what's actually in food doesn't only affect our psychology and craving, but also potentially our metabolism, i.e. the way that we process and get our energy out of our food. There was this study that Mark talks about in his book that was done by someone called Dana Small, and what she found was wild. Dana and her team did an experiment where they made up a bunch of drinks that all had the same amount of a sweetener called sucralose added to them. Therefore, each of these drinks tasted equally sweet. But then, to these drinks, Dana added different amounts of a flavourless starch that's called maltodextrin. So this meant that each drink had a different number of calories in. As I said earlier, your brain uses sweetness to predict calorie content. So now we have a bunch of drinks that all have the same sweetness, so they taste like they have the same amount of energy in them, the same number of calories, but actually they have different amounts. Then they got people to drink them. Dana and her team then used something called a calorimeter to estimate how many calories were being burned when these people drank these drinks. Now a calorimeter does this by analyzing the heat your body produces because when we process calories, we can usually measure a little plume of heat. So this plume of heat in people who just drank the drinks are what Dana and her colleagues were looking for. What they found actually shocked me <laughs> when I read it. I'm normally very unflappable. <laughs> <laughs> in the drink where sweetness matched the number of calories, a lovely little metabolic spike was seen, a cozy little mm, plume of heat. But in all the others where sweetness was not accurately predicting calories, nothing was seen. No heat. It was like a single calorie hadn't been consumed and certainly wasn't being processed. This suggests that sweetness isn't just something that's nice for us. Yes, it's a predictor for the brain, but also that prediction being correct is key in making sure we get the energy out of our food properly. And so when we're faced with a mismatch between what we taste and what we digest, not only do we, again, have that uncertainty going on in the brain, but we may not even be able to process our food properly. Now, this is just one study, and I do think more research needs to be done in the area, as far as I can tell, but, I just thought it was so interesting and it does point to some very intriguing political implications of additives that they may impact how we actually get energy out of our food, which is one of the main biological reasons we eat it, right? So after shedding a bit of a light on why adding additives to food may have a downstream impact on the way we crave and process it, you might be pondering whether or not you should try and swerve them a little bit. But there's one genre of additive that's surely only a good thing, right? Vitamins. Fortifying food with other vitamins to make sure we get what we need is, of course, how could it not be a good thing? Whether it's adding iron to cereal or B vitamins to flour. How could it, how could it not? How, how could it not be? Seriously, I swear to God. Well, guess what team? It's more complicated than that. Let's go back to Italy, back in time, and also for the first time today, to America. Starting in the late 1700s, a disease spread through northern Italy. It was named La Pallegra, meaning rough skin. 
Every year for over a century, symptoms appeared in mid-April, including dark red spots that spread across the body, pale skin, bleeding gums, and diarrhea. In the early 1900s, pellagra arrived in the south of the US. Now to kind of speed through the story, after years of being stumped as to what actually caused pellagra, it was worked out that it's a disease of malnourishment. People with pellagra were missing certain key vitamins in their diet. And so, in their own sort of separate timelines of how this all happened, the Italians and the Americans came up with two very different solutions. The Americans added the missing vitamins to simple carbohydrates like flour, so people could eat the flour and get the vitamins at the same time. This is something known as fortification, and after it, cases of pellagra disappeared almost completely. Sorted. The Italians, on the other hand, went for a more rustic approach. People were encouraged to farm rabbits for cheap meat, to bake bread in communal ovens, and drinking wine was also suggested as part of the solution. Now this sounds almost like a joke, right? But it also worked, just a bit slower than the American method. And if you're wondering about the wine, the wine was actually poorly filtered, which meant it contained a lot of yeast, which was full of one of the vital vitamins that was needed to help people with pellagra. So you've got these two different solutions that both seem to work. But then, as the years went by, something odd happened. In the Italian pellagra zone, people remained healthy. But in the US, what had previously been the pellagra belt was now the obesity belt. The pendulum had swung from one extreme to the other. Pellagra may have been stopped by fortifying flour with vitamins, but this didn't stop the core issue poor nutrition in the area. So it looks like fortification didn't solve the root cause here, and actually people needed proper, nutritious, arguably real food. But in his book, another thing that I found really interesting was that Mark also brings up the suggestion that fortification with vitamins could potentially make weight gain more likely. Is there any evidence for this? Well, vitamins play different roles in your body. So B vitamins, for example, are generally very important for metabolism. We need them to get the energy out of our food. So when you provide someone food with the B vitamins already added, you're providing them with the fuel, the food, and the match, the B vitamins. This seems like it could be a good thing. It ensures that you are actually able to get the energy from your food, which avoids some aspects of malnutrition, like with pellagra. But it can also swing the other way. We eat more vitamins, therefore we can process more food, so we eat more food. And I guess that infers that it's about getting these vitamins in a good amount, in a healthy amount. Now, funnily enough, this adding vitamins that are used to metabolize carbs to simple carbs is exactly what we have done with livestock. We feed them high energy foods fortified with energy processing vitamins. And the reason we do it is because it makes them gain a lot of weight very quickly. So if this is a way to get animals big quickly, could it be having the same impact on us? That's the question to ask and to investigate more. It does feel weird to consider that something like adding vitamins, which seems harmless at worst and very, very good at best, could have its problems. But I just thought it was an interesting perspective. Again, there's evidence there. I think as a field, the area needs a bit more investigation, but yeah, I just thought, like I say, it was interesting to ponder. Now, I'm not saying that fortification is the only thing at play here in the Pellegra US story. And you might say that the reasons for obesity in the Southern US versus Italy are obvious, and it's nothing to do with adding vitamins to stuff. You know, in the Southern states, fried chicken and meat grease and sweet teas are all eaten and drunk, whereas in Italy, it's all olive oil and grilled fish. But as I said, when we're in Northern Italy, it's more butters and broths and cream. And in his book, Mark actually compares the cheese consumption of America and Italy, Northern Italy. The average American, according to him, eats about 35 pounds of cheese a year, but Northern Italians outperform them by several pounds. So again, we turn our attentions back to, well, hang on a minute, what's different about these foods, one aspect is how real said food is. But another difference, and a potentially important one, is people's attitudes towards eating it. Because in a broader sense, the Pellegra story highlights a core difference between the attitude of Italians and Americans towards food. In that case, in that story, Americans saw food as the problem, something that needed to be solved. Whereas in Italy, the food was the solution. And this translates to the differences in the broader culture around food in these places. Because not only does what's in the food seem to differ, but so does the way it's eaten. 
in Italy, eating is an experience in and of itself in a way that it isn't really in places like the US and the UK. For the average person, at least, it isn't. Often we eat whilst doing something else, like watching a TV show or scrolling our phones or sitting on our on our desks or at our desks or walking to the next thing or eating is squeezed into an evening when you come back from work. The emphasis is often on speed, both in food preparation and food consumption. Even in the way we treat ourselves, that's more about consumption than enjoyment. Think about like the way that you might plow through a packet of sweets or biscuits. You know, I feel like most of us have been there where you just finish your whole chocolate bar. And we do this even though research has shown that in those situations, the more you eat in one go, the less pleasure you get from each successive thing that you're eating. So like if you eat a packet of biscuits, you're getting less pleasure each biscuit you go along. But something that can help shift this is the act of being mindful about eating, taking the time to savour it. Mark tells this story of someone called Anya Hilbert, who backs the idea of overcoming intense binge-like cravings by eating something small and delicious, like a well-made chocolate or like a piece of dark chocolate, really, really slowly. Taking the time to really look at it, smell it, and then as you eat it, you really focus on the flavour, you appreciate the food, you give it your full focus. The idea is that if you're appreciating your food and giving it your full focus, then you're more likely to clock when you're satisfied. And then the idea is each time you have a craving, you do this instead. You don't have a packet of biscuits, you have a single square of dark chocolate that you eat very, very slowly. So this all highlights some more core aspects of Italian culture, cooking as a community, eating as a community, and the act of eating is itself a sacred thing that deserves your full attention. And perhaps this is another reason that they eat foods we might deem as unhealthy, but have a healthier relationship with those foods. Now, it's caveat time. Where's my horse? I need to hold my horse. And actually, the horse is called Toffee, so it's kind of appropriate. I can only have one at a time though healthy. Now obviously we don't live in an ideal world and this has all been quite idealistic. In regards to additives, in places like the UK and the US, often eating real food is a far more expensive option and it often takes longer to prepare and time and energy is a luxury that many people do not have. Class and cost are huge things that get in the way of people enjoying real food the way that Italians broadly do. So that is a huge thing that can't be overstated and it's a whole other discussion to be had about like governmental control of food and all that kind of stuff. Also, these are all theories that have some evidence behind them. I feel like they make sense, but also, you know, everyone's relationship with food and their weight is complex with various different factors involved, from your natural metabolism to how accessible exercise is to you, to how, like I say, how accessible good food is to you. There are lots of things at play here and this video covers just some of them and some which I think are quite interesting. In that context too, I've mainly spoken in this video in the context of weight gain, and the relationship between weight and health is another complicated one. It's not as simple as the bigger you are, the less healthy you are. There are also other factors related to diet that are important, like the likelihood of heart disease. On this, it's worth mentioning that in Northern Italy, levels of heart disease are similar to the global average when age matched. And when not age matched, they are higher, but just because Italy has an older population. So it doesn't seem like the case that they're slim but unhealthy. So yeah, those are some caveats. But saying all this, I do think that the idea of eating real food, relishing whilst you eat, and that enjoyment of eating and cooking with community are all, they're all nice things, aren't they? And I think we underestimate the power of them sometimes. And I have genuinely felt a shift in my relationship to food and eating since reading about all this. Um, so maybe you will too, or at least find it interesting. I don't know, I'm just supposing, I'm just supposing maybe, maybe you might, but who's to say? Who's to say? You're still here though, so hopefully you are to say, and what you are saying is, yes, it was all right. Something else I've thought about differently recently is, wait for it, homosexuality. Now I know that was a bit of a handbrake turn, but hear me out, okay? Because it turns out, guys, it's abnormal. I know, as someone engaged to a woman, this came as a bit of a shock to me, but I read this paper by Michael Levin and it really blew my mind. If you can't tell yet, this is some grade A sarcasm. I did read the paper though a little bit ago and I recorded the process of me going through it, having a little look at Michael's arguments and I dare say, taking the piss. Oh, we've got another metaphor. I forgot about this one. Frisbees. 
Frisbees. That video is a little bit NSFW, not safe for work. That was a bit graphic, sorry. Nebula exclusive, guys. <laughs> and so it is up as an exclusive on Nebula, where you can also find other unique content from me, like these, and all my YouTube videos, ad and sponsor free. You see, Nebula is a streaming service for educational and thoughtful content that's been set up by creators as a place where we can be more creative, creative creators, and have more freedom than we have on YouTube. So there are no demonetization symbols hidden around dark corners. It's home to loads of legends who I am frankly flattered to be in the company of. People like Chubby Emu, H Bomber Guy, and Wendover Productions, to name but a few. And like I say, as well as everyone's YouTube videos, ad and sponsor free, there's a lot of stuff on Nebula that cannot be found anywhere else. That includes Nebula Originals, like Broey Deschanel's new Taboo on Screen series, which takes a look at how taboo subjects, like sex over the years, have been represented on screen. You can see why that would be more limited in what it can cover on YouTube. There are also exclusive Nebula classes where you can learn all sorts, from the basics of how to edit videos to how to beat anxiety. And that's advice from an actual therapist. The anxiety part, not the video editing part. Although she could advise you on that as well because she makes great videos. Signing up to Nebula gets you access to all of this and you support us creators who are on there at the same time. And signing up using my link extra supports specifically me. <laughs> By using my link, you can get 40% off an annual subscription to Nebula, so that if I just ring that up, ding, comes to $30 a year, which is about 25 quid. During December, when I'm posting this video, you can also get access to a lifetime membership, so access to Nebula for as long as you're both around, for $300, if you've got that kind of cash and fancy it. And seeing as it's the ho 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 holiday season, you can gift that lifetime membership to people too. If you're at all interested, then go to go.nebula.tv forward slash notes and you will see the different sign up options there. That link is in my description and whatever options you fancy, as I say, signing up to Nebula genuinely really helps me out and I do think it's really worth it for all the stuff you get access to. I'm not just saying that because I'm on there. If you do sign up, thank you so much for the support and let me know what you think of any of my exclusive bits and bobs. That is it for now though everyone, please do like this video if you like it, share it if you share it, subscribe if you subscribe it, and comment with your thoughts and feelings and tummy rumblings about food. Do you love a mindful meal? Are you a community cook? What's your favourite additive? Or your favourite food? Favourite food is actually, I would be really interested to see what people's favourite foods are, so genuinely do comment that, I'm intrigued. That's why I actually am intrigued about. Tell me your favourite foods. I want to know. Otherwise, all that's left to say is grazie mille per la visione. Buona giornata e ricorda, non parlo italiano, che di si gentile con il mio accento. Grazie. Patrons, what is there to say other than grazie mille? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you genuinely for being my patrons. You're the best. I'm Buen Giorno, Puzlius, Androv. Right. So, social media, more your messages. I always feel like such a granny when I say social media. Oh, checking your social media. You know what? These days, social media has really fucked everything up. Ow. Oh, God. <laughs> I've got no idea. I get, I get an after lunch slump. But there's one genre. 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 Dude, full of additives. It's a big black cat. Oh my gosh, it's so fluffy. Wow. Yeah, I get it. Otherwise, all I have to say is grazie mille per la visione. Fuck. <laughs> hey, welcome to the end screen. Feel free to grab a snack, grab a drink from the bar, put on one of our name badges and take a seat. The thing is with the end screen is even though it's only just started, once it starts, it's basically almost already over. There's a link to playlist of videos of me, there's a link to a specific video, and there's a Patreon link. Have a safe trip.